Hello, my name is Jeff Barrett and welcome to another segment of Education Matters. Today in the studio, I have Albie Siegel, President of the Emily Griffith Foundation and Linda Campbell, a community activist and volunteer. Albie's been uh, a very busy man. He's been active in the Jewish community, heading Jewish community centers both in California and in Denver, Colorado. He's also um, been a consultant, very active consultant, heading up two consulting firms, one the Gemini Consulting Group and doing a lot of work with large nonprofits such as the Allied Jewish Federation of Colorado, the National Jewish Health, Big Brother, Big Sisters of Colorado, and many more. In his role after moving into education, Albie founded and launched the New America School, and currently in his role, heading the Emily Griffith Foundation, where revenue has quadrupled under his leadership. We are also joined by Linda Campbell. Welcome for, thank you for coming today. And she has been very active in the community as an activist and volunteer, including her role in Emily Griffith's 100-year celebrations, which we will address in a few minutes. Linda is a founder of the PS1 Charter School and the Denver Preschool Program in her work with the Mayor's Office. She has also served on numerous nonprofit boards, including the Denver Foundation, the Colorado Conservation Trust, and many others. One of her most proud accomplishments is serving as the co-chair with then-Mayor Hickenlooper and his leadership team for early childhood ed education and the work in the Denver Preschool Program, which was a tremendous benefit for our youth in Denver. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Abby, let's start with you. Um, talk about a little bit about your role in the foundation as president, and also talk about the role between the foundation board and its mission, as well as the college itself. Sure. The, the Emily Griffith Foundation was founded in 1991 uh, to support the college in scholarships and uh, uh, classroom equipment and capital improvements and innovative and new programming. Mm -hmm. It was founded when Denver Public Schools withdrew its funding, its support, financial support to, from the, to the college. And we were uh, uh, charged with trying to fill that gap and providing primarily at that time scholarship dollars. Uh, the foundation has always been lean. Uh, when I came, there were two full-time employees, and now there's three. So we're, we're not a big group. Uh, and we, we meet regularly. Jeff and I meet on a, uh, every other week, and I meet with his leadership team to talk about how to stay in alignment with what the college needs are and for us to expose the college to potential funding sources. So we have a small but mighty team that raises... Uh, over two million dollars this year and we'll be giving the college almost all of that. So when you talk about the foundation and its mission, uh, would you say that the primary goal is to really serve students and raise scholarship dollars? That's correct. And, and I would say it equally as important is to provide money for new innovative programming or expansion of programming as, as you mm -hmm. see fit. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a separate 501c3 organization so we have no formal relationship to either the college or the school, or all the Denver Public Schools. Mm -hmm. We have a separate board of directors of 22 directors. Mm -hmm. Jeff, sir, you serve on the board along mm -hmm. with uh, one of your executive uh, uh, leadership team members. And then we have one student that serves on the board as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that board is made up of community activists, just like Linda and, mm -hmm. and others who, who care about vocational education, care about workforce development, and, and care about the glorious 100-year legacy that Emily left. Mm -hmm. When I arrived a little over five years ago, the foundation board looked a little different in its makeup than it does now. I think one thing you can certainly be proud of is the diversity and makeup of the board itself from the industry sectors, whether they currently serve in um, a high level uh, role in their organization or retired, uh, such as John Aragoni from the Boys and Girls Club in his role as executive director. Um, talk about the emphasis on funding stream. So, there, there are obviously a lot of different ways in which you can get it as an individual from the community, engage with the foundation. So you seek out individual donors? We seek out um, money anywhere we can find <laughs> it. Uh, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, healthy nonprofit organizations, whether they're foundations or service organizations, generally will need a diversified revenue stream. And we've spent the last two years really working to diversify the revenue stream of the foundation. 
Um, we get a, a sizable amount of money from local foundations and now some national foundations who, again, believe in the mission of, uh, of strengthening workforce education and vocational training. Uh, we, get, uh, we have a, a cadre of individual donors, some very, very generous, uh, and we're trying to broaden that, that, that scope. And uh, as you can imagine, we work with corporations who find it to their advantage to work with us because, frankly, they're going to hire the students that Emily Griffith Technical College uh, graduates. Mm -hmm. So w we build on all those relationships. We have a planned giving program. Uh, I'll tell you a brief story. That we, have a, mm -hmm. uh, we have a woman, a woman student at the uh, Trades and Industry College at 12050 mm -hmm. Sage in the automobile repair program. And she was going to be interviewed because it's rare to have a young woman student. So one of the TV stations in town was interviewing her and we surprised her with a $2,500 scholarship towards her program. Well, a gentleman saw that on TV. Mm -hmm. He called me the next day and left us $500,000 in his will. Wow. Wow. So it's, uh, I actually have a lot of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, so it's very rewarding. So plan giving is uh, certainly an area of emphasis you see moving forward in building the endowment for the, for the foundation supporting the college. Talk about a couple of uh, success stories over this past year. I mentioned that under your leadership, <coughs> revenue has quadrupled, if you will, and not only from the grant activity, but individual donors and corporations. I think the corporations and the private sectors really come on board with understanding and believing our mission as a college. So. Talk about some success stories like the Miller Coors and sure. some of those partners, Daniel's Fund, for sure. instance. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Miller Coors came to uh, Jeff, actually, mm -hmm. uh, saying, we have a tremendous need for uh, water, qu water quality engineers, and there's really no suitable training ground. If we gave you some money to help initiate a program, would you do it? So the foundation got involved in this, and Miller Coors, uh, first round gave us $180,000 to start a water quality program, which turned out to be highly successful. Dozens of students, uh, may, most of them getting jobs upon mm -hmm. graduation, mm -hmm. still growing today, mm -hmm. and Miller Coors has just this year re-upped for another $180,000 so that we can expand that program. So we're meeting their needs mm -hmm. and the needs of the Denver community. Sure. Uh, we found uh, that one of, the, one of the obstacles to students succeeding was their inability to pay for the fees and mm -hmm. equ equipment, the barbering equipment or the welding equipment or the, the uniforms for the nursing uh, programs. Uh, so uh, the Daniels Fund created a, uh, a closet, if you will, mm -hmm. of equipment mm -hmm. that we can loan or give, have the students buy at a discount for all of our programs, for all of our students. Mm -hmm. They have given us $50,000 a year, and we went through that first 50 in mm -hmm. about six months. Right. So we're supplementing it now, right. and the Daniels Fund is, couldn't be more pleased with how they're helping our students. Another great example is we also found that uh, one of the st reasons our students don't succeed is that life gets in the way. Yes. Childcare, transportation, mm -hmm. housing, mm -hmm. health. And so we started something we call the 360 degree fund. And seeding that fund was the Rose Community Foundation. Mm -hmm. And they've now given us $60,000 in its second round wow. just to help students with those, with those needs. And students can come to our office, and if they have an immediate problem, we can give them $500 in cash immediately on the spot to help solve that problem so they can be in class the next day. Wow, what a great story. So we have um, some other corporate sponsors like Shop Automotive who works with our automotive program, for instance, and we'll talk about the Mini Cooper donation as part of our 100-year activities after the break. But one of the things that I'm excited um, in working with the foundation is that they really listen to the needs of the college. They have really helped connect me and connected my team with the various funders, and we've been supportive in that effort. But the reality is, is that higher education funding in this state is uh, one of the lowest in the country. So we have to balance the needs of our students and try not to put those um, burdens on our students' backs. And I think the foundation has done a wonderful job in that. So thank you for that relationship. So before we move into uh, intermission and talk more after the break with Ms. Campbell and with Abby again as far as our 100-year activities, um, just wanted to say that um, as a college and we moving forward, 
in working with our foundation, we're excited about the broad diversity of our board makeup in that our student population is 33% um, Hispanic, for instance, so we're a Hispanic serving institution and we're very conscious in trying to add diversity not only to our staff but to the foundation board as well. And I think Alby has done a wonderful job in some some new members that have come on board recently. You want to talk about some of those? Well, I, I, we have made a serious effort in the last two years to make sure that the board of directors of the foundation reflects not only the college but Denver's community. Mm -hmm. So our 22 member board is in fact 30% uh, Hispanic, it's 20% African American, it's 3% Asian American, and, uh, and, from, and, and in a broad age range from the student on our board who's 23 years old to um, some retired uh, business folks on our board who are in their late 60s, early 70s. So it's, it's really quite an, am an amazing group mm -hmm. from different industry sectors. Mm -hmm. for, uh, they fill needed roles. We have an attorney on our board who does, gives us mm -hmm. pro bono work as an attorney. We have one of the leading social, inter, social uh, uh, media experts in the state, in the country probably on our board, who mm -hmm. advises us there. We have people who are expert in fundraising. So we've really worked hard to be a diverse board. And some of our board members, we, we encourage all of them, uh, spend time at the college, mm -hmm. sit in on classes, mm -hmm. speak with the, teach, with the students. Mm -hmm. And I love that. So, as we move into break, I um, uh, hope you're thinking about the activities of the scholarship, um, of the foundation and the activity they generate, such as our scholarship dollars. And when we get back, uh, we'll have a conversation about that 100-year party of the century and other celebration activities. Nearly 100 years ago, a Denver school teacher by the name of Emily Griffith opened a school. Not just any school, but one where Emily hoped that any working person who had an hour or two to spare may come and study what they could to make life more useful. She knew she wanted to call this school Opportunity. And on September 9, 1916, the doors opened for the School of Opportunity. The popularity of the school was a surprise, as she had hoped for 200 students to enroll that first day. Instead, she ended up with 1,400. The school started with classes ranging from telegraphy to typing, culinary to hairdressing, also English for the immigrants that were flowing into the state so that they too could find meaningful employment, an effort close to Emily's heart. As the needs of the community changed, so did the School of Opportunity, adding courses like machine shop for the war effort and nursing, also many business classes. Emily retired in 1933, and against her objections, the school was renamed in her honor the Emily Griffith Opportunity School, but the story does not end here. Emily Griffith Opportunity School is now Emily Griffith Technical College, a name that better reflects the current times and needs for the business world. More than 50 career training certificate programs with hands-on education and training in health sciences, business and technology, creative arts and design, and trades and industry. I love Emily Griffith. I love the teachers, I love the program, I like the people that come here, there's a huge diversity. And we still have Colorado's oldest and largest English as a second language program with more than 40 day and evening classes. Yes, ESL program is very important for me because I need to improve my level of English but I can uh, here improve my level completely. Plus, the least expensive college programs in Colorado with financial aid and scholarships. Many students even graduate debt-free. It has taken care of my education completely. It has paid for my schooling and my supplies. So many programs to fit any person's needs. And we are still growing. The vision of Emily Griffith Technical College is to be the premier college of excellence in the delivery of career and technical education. It's very exciting in that we can house most of our functions in this brand new downtown campus serving our students just as we had in 1916, providing opportunities for all who wish to learn, as well as our location at 200 East 9th where our video production program is housed along with our broadcast studio. And we recently have moved into our new branch campus at 1205 Osage Street, which will house our College of Trades and Industry a state-of-the-art facility that houses 50,000 square feet of instructional programming. With our 50-plus certificate programs spread out among three different campuses, we're hoping to build capacity, continue to offer the same grade instruction at the least expensive tuition point in the state of Colorado. We truly do offer opportunity. 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 For all who wish to learn.
Emily Griffith Technical College is turning 100 years old, and we want you to join in the fun. The Emily Griffith Foundation is presenting a year-long community celebration, opening doors of opportunity for 100 years. Here's how you can play a part. Are you one in two million? Shop Automotive has donated a three-year lease on a Mini Cooper that one lucky alum of Emily Griffith Technical College will win. All you have to do is sign up. Go to egfoundation.org for more information. And welcome back to this segment of Education Matters. I'm joined in the studio today by, uh, with Albie Siegel from the Emily Griffith Foundation, the president of the foundation. We also have Linda Campbell, who is a leading community activist and volunteer and does a tremendous amount of work for the Emily Griffith Foundation and the 100 year celebrations. So um, as an audience member, you got a glimpse of our three campuses located at 1860 Lincoln Street, 1205 Osage Street, and the campus we're filming from here at 200 East 9th Street, which houses our broadcast studio, TV station, and video production program. So we've built a lot of capacity in the last few years in growing our programs. And if you've read the history on Emily Griffith, which I know you both are well versed in, is that at one time, Emily Griffith had 34,000 students across the city of Denver, located across hundreds of locations. Whether it was a church basement or a storefront doing uh, retail sales training, whatever the case may be, we're not at that point in, in our um, capacity building, but we are moving towards some pretty exciting growth. And with that growth, obviously, we, you know, takes some financial assistance because we can't do it just based upon the fact that um, we, again, as I mentioned in the first segment, we would like to keep the debt and burden off of our students and grow our capacity with the help of our industry partners, our philanthropic partners uh, through the foundation efforts, as well as our many other affiliations throughout the Metro Denver area. So this year, Emily Griffith turns 100 years old. And you have a host of activities planned, Albie, for kicking off the celebration, uh, beginning actually last year with our Parade of Lights. So take us through that, and then Linda can talk through specifically some of the activities she's working on, which I think is um, tremendously exciting for both those folks that don't know about Emily Griffith as well as some of our alumni. The purpose of celebrating the 100th year is really very simple. It's to correct any misperceptions that the public may have about Emily Griffith Technical College, to raise the awareness of the college, and to um, position the foundation for a future fundraising campaign to create a long-term endowment for the college. So it's not to raise money, particularly, but it's to change awareness and raise awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, we've created five activities, each one strategically directed towards a different audience. The first one is a series of, of parties and gatherings for our alumni. And Shop Automotive has donated a Mini Cooper for a free drawing for anyone who ever went to Emily Griffith. So if you ever went to Emily Griffith in any capacity, please call the office, go online to our website, and sign up for the free drawing for the Mini Cooper. The second activity is aimed at our individual donors, and that's the party of the century on February 12th of Emily's birthday. Uh, that will be at the Colorado History Museum. There'll be no solicitations, there'll be no sit-down dinners, there'll be no speeches. It's a party to celebrate 100 years of Emily Griffith's legacy. Curious Theater has written an original one-act play uh, and they'll be, be performed that night. Hank Troy will be playing his piano in the beginning of the party and Lanny Garrett and her band will be playing uh, through in, into the evening. The third activity is designed for our uh, partners in the corporations and in the foundation world. And that'll be our second annual Legacy of Learning Breakfast, also at the Colorado History Museum. At that breakfast, we will give an award to the company and the individual who have supported lifelong learning. The individual this year who will be awarded is Elaine Gantz Berman, and the company will be the Denver Post. And the fare at that breakfast, the food that's served, are five different traditional breakfasts from five of the 94 countries that our students come from. The, the, another one of the activities we're doing is called Touching Tomorrow, and that's to look to the future of workforce education. And in Vail, Colorado, in conjunction with the Vail Symposium, we'll be hosting 10 corporate CEOs from around the country, 10 educators from around the country, and 10 vocational students from around the country to sit in various sessions to discuss the future of workforce education. We'll compose that, compile that information into a white paper that will be delivered to the just elected new president of the United States. The fifth activity I'll let Linda explain, and that's mm -hmm. the exhibit that, we're, that she is curating. Sure, so Linda? Uh, thank you. Um, the 
we're calling the exhibit for all who wish to learn 100 years of Emily Griffith's legacy and it opens on August 9th at the Denver Public Library uh, the Western History Department and um, it has three different elements one is um, a, a tribute to Emily herself and uh, when I read Deborah Faulkner's book called Touching Tomorrow, I was very moved and Albie had asked me if I wanted to curate the exhibit. And um, once I read that book, I said, this is a woman who I really would like to help get um, some of the recognition that she deserves. And so uh, that's when I said, yes, this is something that I wanted to be involved with. So the center of the exhibit will be a tribute to Emily herself and it'll have some of her quotes. and. We have a, a dress that she wore um, on Box Pop Radio, which uh, I think was kind of like Prairie Home Companion in the 1940s. It moved around to different locations mm -hmm. in the country and interviewed people um, in the, you know, important people in different communities. And so we have the dress that she wore and, um, and also the recording of her true voice um, that will b be part of that um, exhibit. And then she was killed shortly after that um, recording in 1947 in an unsolved, mis uh, unsolved murder. So mm -hmm. there's um, some intrigue around that, and, and right. that'll be represented in the exhibit too. Uh, another part of the exhibit is we will represent um, about 25 to 30 of the many, many, many different programs that have um, been a part of, of the school's history. Um, some from the past, there's, uh, there are quite um, unique, like nylon stocking repair, <laughs> um, vulcanizing. I wasn't familiar with that term. I had to Google it, and I still am not really sure what vulcanizing is, but there was a vulcanizing class back in the 1930s. Um, and then obviously many, um, many of the programs coming forward. Another uh, very interesting program that I was just researching yesterday was um, on the aircraft repair and maintenance program mm -hmm. that was a partnership between the school and Lowry Air Force Base. And um, as I was reading this document that I found, it was amazing to realize all of the ways that the school was involved in the war effort. You know, everything from training aircraft um, repair and maintenance people, but I guess um, the Army had trouble with some of their recruits, didn't have the math skills they needed, so Emily Griffith provided the uh, math training. Um, as, as people moved to Denver, as the military personnel moved to Denver, um, they needed more um, physician's assistants, more dental assistants, and Emily Griffith provided um, that kind of training. Of course, there was housing that was being built because of all the personnel that was moving to Denver, and so they um, had many apprentice programs in the trades. So um, Emily would be very proud to see that throughout the 100 years, um, that something that was very important to her was that the school provided the real skills that employers needed. And so it's, it's um, fascinating to look at the history of Denver's economy and see the way that the classes have changed mm -hmm. to reflect what the needs of the community were at that time. So we're, we're honored in that. Denver Public Library has graciously hosted the event. So, and the event kicks off on what day? August 9th, uh, um, and then it runs through December of this year. And it's on the fifth floor of the Western History Department. And um, there will be different events uh, associated with it. Um, the, we're thinking uh, for Halloween that we'll have the cosmetology students mm -hmm. do some you know, face painting mm -hmm. to try to get the, uh, the kids and their families down to see sure. the exhibit and, and different mm -hmm. activities like that. Sure. So when you were combing archives and artifacts, where did you find this stuff? I know the old building certainly housed a lot of these artifacts, if you will. Who did you partner with to collect all this stuff? Well, we did some some scavenging, <laughs> we called it. And after the um, after everybody moved out of the old building, we went in and dug through closets. And I kind of thought we wouldn't find that mm -hmm. much of interest, but we found some really fascinating stuff. The mm -hmm. cosmetology, in particular, we found mm -hmm. some really um, really strange equipment. Uh, you know, the things that women do to have our beautiful hair is it's amazing. But we found this old, um, it was a small piece of equipment and it said fur machine on it and it looked like it was old, you know, like from the 1930s. So mm -hmm. I went home and Googled what is a fur machine and um, 
it was for sewing fur, you know, for collars onto coats. And um, we found, you mentioned the water quality management. We found this green box um, that was probably about 18 inches by 30 inches and had two handles on the outside. And when you opened it up, there was a bunch of, it looked like scientific equipment, test hmm. tubes, beakers, and um, some of the, the letters, you know, kind of like um, the, uh, what's it called? The, um, that you might use to describe a chemical. And so mm -hmm. I thought that possibly sure. it was um, some sort of medical equipment. So I took a picture of it and showed it to a doctor friend of mine. And he said, no, that looks like water quality equipment to me. <laughs> and so then I showed it to the water quality <laughs> teacher and he said, yes, that um, students from Emily Griffith High School hmm. used to be involved in a program called River Watch where they would carry that box by the two handles a couple of blocks down to the Platte River and then wow. test the water and that's how they learned their science. And wow. did you know did you know that um, when they were doing some construction around the the 1205 Osage Trades and Industry site they uncovered original wood pipe that the water wow. flowed through right. and they have it there now. Heard that. Jeff has it oh, cool. in the water quality classroom, oh. that original that wood pipe. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh -huh. Right. So things like so. that. You know, one thing leads to another and somebody tells me a story and then I go track it down and, and we'll show a lot of those interesting pieces of old equipment, both the tools and the products um, that, ha that are made by um, the students in the school. So a fascinating project as part of the year-long celebration. And you know, we all three could talk about stories from just interactions with people on the street. Every meeting I go to, I hear a story. I just heard an interesting story. They were talking about the reason there are so many red fox in Denver is because, well, we taught those types of classes at one time and raised fox here in Denver. And I don't think what, what the plural of fox is, but um, mm -hmm. we raised a ton of those in Denver. And it's all because of the type of industry that Emily Griffith trained classes for. Which and when then, and then in, in, I think it was in the early 1950s, the city council outlawed domestication of foxes. So people let them go. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons there's so many foxes in Denver on the golf courses and in the open spaces. So if you have a fox problem in your neighborhood, <laughs> don't blame me. I don't want any <laughs> phone calls. But uh, it's an interesting tie to the school. And you can't be around for 100 years without an amazing connection and deep-rooted kind of fabric of what we do tied into the Denver community at large. So, so we start off with Party of the Century. So it's a prohibition themed event where I understand there's cocktails from the era. We're encouraged to wear dress from that era. Um, I can't wait to find out what I'm going to be wearing for that, but it'll be an interesting <laughs> so discovery. So Jeff, uh, Emily ran the school, had mm -hmm. your job right. from 1916 to 1933, Yep, the exact same years that prohibition was in effect in Colorado. Oh, wow, right. interesting. And I've actually heard that radio broadcast that you referred to, Linda, and it's a fascinating, kind of gave me chills when I heard it because you hear her voice. Right. And I've read a ton of stuff that she has written herself and others have written about her, but to hear her speak about the school, here's a woman who was deeply humble and had this sense of humility that I, I wish I could, <laughs> could brag about, but she, she certainly was very deeply connected and a manipulator in her own way. I think she had some oh, yeah. pretty strong uh, sales skills because she had a tremendous thing. So last thing in the, in the minute we have moving forward, so we have these five events, tremendous amount of excitement beginning on February 12th with the party of the century. So what are some things moving forward as far as the foundation? How, you, how do you build upon this 100 years? The Touching Tomorrow event is certainly a part of that, but what are some activities you would like to see? Talk about the endowment, for instance. So the, the, the goal of the foundation is to see that we support Emily Griffith, and we'd like to see our revenues come about 50% from fundraising and philanthropy, about 25% from, uh, uh, from an endowment fund that we're hoping to be able to mm -hmm. create, and about 25% from a, a very... Uh, unique and interesting project we've, we have started on uh, called the Opportunity Campus. We're building a, a building for a, with a 240 affordable housing units and uh, a social enterprise hub and uh, moving a few of the programs from the college over to across the street where there's more public access and a roof t uh, top floor community event center. Uh, wow. That will provide a long-term uh, endowment revenue stream for the college. Wow. So as you can see, tons of activity. I want to thank my guests, Albie Siegel, president of the Emily Griffith Foundation. Thank Linda Campbell, who is a 
a uh, community activist, volunteer, a curator of Emily's Spirit, certainly after this year. And um, we thank you for your participation today and thank hope you. you enjoyed this segment of Education Matters. Thank you. Mm.